Heavenly Father, you are the Father of lights. You are the Father of our hearts. You're our God, you're our Savior, you're our Lord. And we just receive from you this morning everything that you have for us. We know it's good. We're grateful in advance, Lord. And Lord, I'm just, um, I'm grateful that hearts, my heart, our hearts opened to your heart, power and authority released from heaven into our earth. And we thank you for it, Lord. And we bless you. It's in Jesus' name we pray. And if you agreed with that, you said, amen. amen. That was a little weak. How do you say it again? Amen. Come on, that's better. Come on, yeah. A little low ebb here. That's all right. It's, it's early service, right? Some of you are still waking up. It's okay, not a problem. Um, listen, I, a couple years ago, I had the opportunity to minister here. And the Lord put a word in my heart about um, the priority of love. And when I say the priority, he actually gave me a pathway. I called it a foundation at the time. But in, in synopsis, uh, the, the, the message went like, we love him because he first loved us. So we should receive love first. Instead of trying to pursue giving love, we should be receivers of his love in our heart first. When we receive from him, then we are empowered through his love, his word, his grace, the things that come into our heart as we're receiving to actually give back to him and to others what he has given to us. And we're not to flip-flop in our hearts or our minds, hey, I have to go out and do something to love God. No, actually, the priority is to receive love. And the way that the Lord knows that we're actually receiving from him is by we giving him thanks for the things that he's giving. So we actually recognize, we remember, we, we understand what he's doing, and we say thank you in the same way that if you do something for someone that is full of love and they say thank you to you, you recognize, ah, they received the thing that I just gave them and now we have fellowship and relationship. If they don't say thanks and they just walk away, you're like, okay, I still love them. Not changing, but there's something missing in the relationship. They didn't realize that I just gave them something that was significant to me. Amen. Right, so God's like that. He's like, hey, I'm giving to you constantly. I love you like crazy, right? And uh, the way that I know that you're getting it is by you saying thank you for what I'm actually doing. Now, here's the crazy thing for me. When I began to do that foundation or that pathway with the Lord, the Lord began to correct me nonstop. Like, and then he showed me this passage of scripture in Hebrews. He's like, I correct those that I love, right? Hey, don't, this isn't bad. I mean, yeah, you're not doing things right. That's not, that's not bad. What's good is that you're being corrected so that you don't keep doing the wrong thing. <laughs> no correction is pleasant at the moment, but it's really good. It yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by the correction itself. That's what the word of God says. Right? So, so I started like, this is amazing. I'm being corrected constantly. And then, this is a good thing. This is not a bad thing. And then the Lord brought up a topic. The topic was humility. Say humility. So humility is defined a lot of different ways, okay? But I'm gonna take us to a passage of scripture. If you have Bibles, uh, you can open them uh, here at this stage. Uh, but we are going uh, to a passage of scripture here, Philippians 2, 5 through 8, okay? Philippians 2, 5 through 8. This is what Paul is writing to the Philippians. He says this, have this attitude in yourselves, which was also in Christ Jesus, 
who, as he already existed in the form of God, did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but emptied himself by taking the form of a bond servant and being born in the likeness of men. And being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Okay, so Paul's encouraging the Philippians. He's saying, hey, I want you to have or let this mind or this attitude be in you, which was in your Savior, our Savior, Jesus Christ, who did not consider equality with God a thing to be grasped, even though he was God before time and created the heavens and the earth by his word, didn't he emptied himself, made a decision to not be carrying that kind of authority at that moment and submitted himself to his father all the way to the point of death. So Paul's saying to the Philippians, I want you to be like that. (laughs) Oh, have that mind in you. And in fact, I think, you know how Paul he constantly is talking about cruci- being crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Paul's like, if you choose death to yourself, humble yourself before the Father and don't consider equality with him a thing to be grasped, it will go well with you. Hmm. But here's the thing about humility. Um. The beauty of it is not in the humility itself. It's in what it attracts. Humility attracts something. Can anybody tell me what it is? Yes, who said grace? Yes, you're right. Humility attracts grace. Now, (laughs) we're going to get into grace. We're going to park on grace for quite a while here this morning because grace is a crazy, crazy uh, word. And uh, I'm gonna start by uh, telling you a story, actually, of something that happened to Jan and I, my wife Jan and I. Jan, will you wave? This is my wife Jan, you can give her a hand. She's beautiful and lovely and worthy of honor. Um, we, uh, We had to make a trip down to Arizona to pick up my dad's car. And I have nine children, eight boys, one girl, and we needed to um, drive down or fly down, grab a car, and then drive the car all the way back up. And I thought, well, this is an interesting opportunity to take a mini vacation as a family, and um, we're going to be going through some places that I have never been before, like Utah. How many of you have been to Utah and seen some of the national parks in Utah? Totally beautiful, right? Gorgeous, ridiculous, insane. I didn't know, I mean, I'd heard, and I'd heard from the Van Gelders in particular because they have taken their family on journeys there. And so I reached out to Pastor Jamie and Nicole, and I said, hey, we have this much time in Utah, and we've heard that the stars are beautiful there, it's an open heaven, that you've had encounters there. We would love to actually go and where you have gone before. Could you help us? And... Pastor Jamie, like within 15 minutes, had given me an entire, well, he asked me a couple questions. He says, where are you going? How long you want to be there? Um, what do you got for time? And then within 15 minutes, he had put back to me an entire itinerary of what to do, where to go, how long to spend, restaurants to go to in Moab. I mean, the whole nine yards. I don't know how to, describe this particular experience, but he created a pathway for me in love because I wanted to be a blessing to my family and it exploded on the inside. I, don't, I, I was like shocked by how loved I felt in that moment, just shocked. I looked at the thing, I'm like, what is going on in my heart right now? This is wild. Like, okay, this is good. I'm super excited. This is gonna be great. 
We're going to go and we're going to have these experiences and it's going to be awesome. And we got down there, all kinds of things changed. The reasons that we had to pick up the, the car were the same, but the getting, anyway, timings just got all thrown off. So then our journey got a little bit muddled at the beginning. We got to Utah a day later than I was thinking we were going to. Not a big deal, right? We're just going to go see stuff and it's going to be awesome. And then the creme de la creme was going to be at night, the sunset at arches, and then we we're going to go to the night sky uh, right there close to arches at their secret spot that Jamie let me go to. I'm like, ah, oh, right? All of that, and we got to the sunset. It was cloudy. I'm like, oh, All my expectation just, all right, we got to go to Eaton Moab. We'll go to Eaton Moab. Then we'll go to see the stars. Praying like crazy, Lord, part the skies. We need, we need to see the stars. We get to that portion of our journey. We get out, secret spot, nothing above our heads. Zero clouds everywhere. This is not what I expected. This is not what I was hoping for. But somewhere in the back of my head, I'm like, I've been on these journeys with Pastor Jamie in the past. We've gone on trips, and it's the pursuit of the thing in God that actually gets the result. So just be patient. It's coming. It's like there's just like assurance on the inside of my heart. We get to Colorado, we sleep overnight. My wife, Jan, um, wakes up middle of the night and says, Jim, I just had a dream. I said, Woo, tell me about the dream. Well, I saw the stars. And a man came to me and said, you see that? That's the Michelangelo. And she's like, Jim, do you know that, that fresco painting? I think it's in Florence, Italy, on the Sistine Chapel ceiling where God's stretching his finger to man and the spark of life is being transferred from God to man? Do you know that one? That's what he was showing me. And so we got to talking. We started, I'm like, I feel like this has something to do about grace. Like this is a picture in the stars, in the heavens, of God reaching constantly toward man, never failing, never stopping, never ceasing, wanting to connect that spark of life between him and us, relationship and intimacy, the flow of heaven, the goodness of the new covenant, he's constantly reaching for that so that we will connect. <laughs> so we'll turn our hearts and connect. And you know, the, the, the man in that painting on the ceiling of the Sistine Chapel that Michelangelo had created, the man is just laissez-faire with his finger. He's just like, ah, if I could only just raise my finger a little bit to touch God. And the guy is ripped, right? I mean, he's like a, a Roman, I mean, he's just ripped. Like he's done work on his physical body. But oh, should I just reach to God? Right? There's, there's effort that he's put into himself, but not necessarily toward seeking the Lord to receive his grace. But it's, it's not, um, it doesn't stop the Lord, his faithfulness to, to continue to reach. Doesn't stop him. He keeps reaching. He keeps working. He keeps giving opportunities for us to connect with his heart because that's actually where grace is flowing from. And I, I'm going to just quickly uh, mention this passage of Scripture. It's with Noah. The first mention of grace in Scripture is Noah. And the Bible says Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. <laughs> now, forever, I interpreted that Scripture as, oh, Noah actually got favor from God, and he decided to pour out favor on Noah. But I don't actually think that's true. I think, I think Noah, a little bit like Enoch, who walked with God and was not, because the Lord took him, kind of similar generation there, I think Enoch and Noah were gazing into the eyes of the Lord, which are windows to his soul, his heart, and found 
grace. <laughs> Found it. And the result of him finding grace was we get to live here together today. <laughs> Human beings were saved from a flood, right? God rescued humanity because of grace being given from him to Noah. <laughs> the salvation of the earth, all of humanity, everything we know and see, our very existence because of that moment of finding grace. Pretty crazy, right? Okay. So, but humility is the thing that attracts grace. Uh, James 4, 6 says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And so, um, there's many definitions of grace that have been proposed kind of through history. You've heard them. Like, for example, unmerited favor. It's a good definition. Divine enablement, power from on high. Great definition. Um, one time from this stage, one of the speakers uh, came through and said, you know, in the Bible, the Lord never actually gives us a, a specific definition of what grace means or is. It's not like faith with faith is the substance of things hoped for, the evidence of things not seen, and faith comes by hearing the word of God. Faith without works is dead, or so without action is dead. It's not like that. There's not a hall of, of grace mentioned like there's a hall of faith in Hebrews 11, right? There's not that. But grace is like pervasive throughout the Bible. The word's used constantly, even like Zerubbabel, in Zechariah, when he's building the, uh, the, the temple, the, the capstone is brought forth with shouts of grace, grace to it, right? There's all these things about grace. But here's what I want to say. There is one verse, and it's in Ephesians, you know it, 2, 8, and 9. It says this, for by grace you are saved or have been saved through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. That scripture is saying that grace is a gift. Now, <laughs> here's how I like to picture it. If you open this gift of grace, on the inside of it is all things that pertain to life and godliness. Let me say it again. On the inside of this gift are all things that pertain to life and godliness. And the way that we received it is by believing into Jesus. You and I received all things that pertain to life and godliness when we received Jesus by his grace. Grace flowed into our hearts and the fullness of who he is and all that he's done actually stop or resides, that's the word, inside of our hearts at that moment. But just like Pastor Doyle preached last week about the fruits of the spirit, if you didn't get that part of that message last week, you need to listen to it again, incredible Love, he says, we're not under law, which limits. We're under grace, which it's incredible uh, scripture in and of itself. But, but grace gives you limitless access to the character and nature of who God is. And it's already been given to you. It's an implanted word that comes in seed form. That's the problem with the goodness of God is it's implanted in seed form. I say it's a problem. It's not. It's how it works. So it starts small. Seeds are small, but it's already given. The great thing about grace, it's been given. You have it. It's yours, and we get to move in it, not trying to create by ourselves without him, but to create with him and because of him, agreeing with him, letting him, do the fullness of the work that he's already planted in the, on, on the inside of us. 
<laughs> so, so, so for those of us who have wrestled with, I have to be better at this or this or this, and now I'm trying to, no, 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 no. Like, you've been given it. It's been given to you. What do you need for life and godliness? It's been given to you by a father through grace. It's in your heart. Lean into it. Receive what he's given in love at your salvation and allow him to grow, allow him to grow the, the seed of whatever it is that you need on the inside of you until you are full blown, bearing fruit strong in the Lord in all of his ways. You know, I would hope that maybe that's better preaching. Maybe it's not good preaching. That should be like a super happy moment for us. <laughs> y'all, y'all, we, we, we've been given, we've been given authority. We've been given love. We've been given grace, humility. Wow, we've been given humility. <laughs> We're not manufacturing humility. We're not manufacturing it. We've been given it. Jesus was the way. This is what he did. The reason we can have this attitude or let it happen on the inside of us is because he is at work in us both to will and to do of his good pleasure. This is where God, through grace, is literally at work creating in us his ways. Let him. Let him. There's another word in scripture. It says put. Put on these character things, meekness and love and kindness and faithfulness. Put it on. Put it in order, right? So how are we participating? We're not doing the work. We're receiving the work of God. We're letting him do the work. And then we're, we're partnering. We're saying, oh, we'll step out on that. Yep, I can, I, mm, that's authentic. Yep, that's true. You've built that in me. I can walk into that now with strength and Manifest who you are in my life. Mind blowing. Okay, you're not quite as happy as I am, but it's okay. It's all right. I, I, I'm good with that. You're all right. I want to unpack a scripture while I spill water all over the place. It's Hebrews 4.16. Could you put that up on the board for me? Hebrews 4.16, here's what it says. Let us therefore come boldly to the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Here's how I picture grace. Who is sitting on the throne? Who is? Jesus, God the Father, sitting on the throne. God is love. True? That's what John says about God. God is love. I have absolute love sitting on absolute authority on the throne, and it's called the throne of grace. So love's work toward us in authority when we approach the throne to receive mercy, which is basically the elimination of every obstacle that would prevent us from experiencing the flow of his grace. Receive mercy, get our feet washed, right? Remember that he's cleansed us. Clean up our messes. Forgive those who have hurt us. Release mercy to those. We're not judging them. We're releasing mercy to them. We're not holding their sins against them. The reason we're doing that is so we can connect with grace, which is the, we're under grace, not the law. We're not in the old covenant. We're in the new covenant. Grace is tied with the covenant as the flow of God that connects us to him and us to each other. Okay, so grace is the flow of the new covenant from Father in relationship to our hearts into our hearts that connects us to him and then connects us 
to each other. The power of God to connect through righteousness because of the covenant, because of mercy, which Jesus paid, because of the washing of feet, because of the healing of our hearts, the receiving of that, then grace flows from his heart, like Noah, into our hearts, and then we relate to God and each other in the flow of the covenant of the living God, our new covenant. Okay. But because it's a throne, whenever God speaks, he speaks in love and authority. And he's creating, when we receive grace, he's creating on the inside of us love and authority. Uh, uh, Ephesians chapter 2, verse 6 says, we're seated in heavenly places with Christ. And I've thought of this many, many times. It's a lovely thing to be kind of bi-locational, right? Heaven and earth. That's who we are. It's not about living in Arizona and Minnesota, not bilocational that way, right? But it's bilocational. We live there and we live here. And in there, we're seated. On the floor? Why are we sitting? Where are we sitting? Come on, who said the throne? We're sitting on thrones that he gave to us when we gave him our heart, we said, Lord, you can have my life. Here's my heart. And the Lord said, I'm giving you my heart. I've already done that. I'm going to give it to you, and I'm going to crown you with authority. <laughs> I'm crowning you. You are now a king before me. And you're seated in heavenly places with me on a throne. So when you go to the throne, it's like going sideways in heaven. Like, oh, I'm here already. I'm seated on the throne, but I need your help. Because humility says, I'm not you, God. I'm not you. I'm never going to be you, ever. I'm going to be your child raised up. You're always going to have authority and my humility before you is here I am. Not me. Like, I need you. And I know you want to get your glory and power and authority through me in the realm that you give me. In the authority place that you give me, you want me to manifest your kingdom, your goodness, and your love. And I need you to do that. Right? I'm seeking your face for relationship, for who you are, and for all that you have empowered me and entrusted me and have an expectation toward me of living in authority with you on the earth. Humility allows the grace to flow. Doesn't consider equality with God a thing to be grasped. Jesus emptied himself. He made a choice. He emptied himself, though being God, he emptied himself. And then he demonstrated humility by obedience, say obedience, to his father all the way to the point of death. Jesus chose in the Garden of Gethsemane when he really wanted to bail on the assignment. Oh, can we do this another way, Father? I'm, I'm sweating blood. Jesus now, right? I'm sweating blood. Can we do this another way, please? I don't want to go to the cross. Who could blame him, Right? I don't want to do this. The whole sin of the weight of the world on me. <sighs> Never experienced that. I'm perfect. Like, like, didn't want to go through it. But then he says, nevertheless, not my will, yours be done. Not my way, your way. Not my thoughts about this, your thoughts about this. I receive yours as higher than mine. It's humility. I receive your throne I receive the throne over my life, and then I've given you my heart, and I give you back the throne that you've given me because I'm going to serve you in this through grace, which pours into my heart by your covenant. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. 
the uh, the authority that he gives us at the house we say change the world start at home forever I've had this expression going through my head home is where the heart is it's not biblical you've heard the expression though right Home is where the heart is. So change by the grace of the Lord your heart. Make choices in your heart to be receiving from him and letting him create in you his full character, his fullness, right? In me, his fullness of character. Let him do that. Partner with God for that. And change the heart of who, where you're at. And then, so that's true if you're single or if you're married, if you're young or you're old, the starting place is your heart. And then you've been given authority if you got married. How many married people do I have in here? Raise your hand. Okay. If you get married, you add another layer, don't you? Of complexity, of loveliness, of challenge, of glory, of all kinds of things, you add that layer. And then you have choices in marriage. Husbands love your wives as Christ loved the church and laid his life down for her. Right? It's a choice for a guy. Um, wives, submit to your husbands. Submission is definitely death. Right? Submit to your husbands. As to the Lord, trusting him, the Lord, to get his will through your husband, imperfect authority, but authority in your life because of what the Lord's given him at the time that you both said yes in marriage. Not because they're lording it over you, which they might be doing it the wrong way, but they still have been given authority by God. They might have to learn how to exercise authority, but you've been given authority, husbands, in your wives' lives, you need the Lord's help to rule and to reign within your household well. How do I do this? Jesus, I need grace. Why are we always fighting? She's always wrong. Uh, <laughs> come on. Dang. Right? Okay, Lord, sorry, that's not true, is it? It's not true. Help. I need help to have intimate relationship as a husband and a wife should have it in our hearts with each other. Help. And then he does give the help from heaven. But that's authority that's been given in a relationship. Then you have children. Yikes. Right? Now you and your wife... You and your husband now have another layer. This is home as the house defines, you know, home. Change the world, start at home. Oh, my gosh. How am I going to be good there? I have to learn how to manage these unruly children. I have to learn how to rule and reign. Dang, Lord, I need grace from heaven to do that. And I need a priority system on the inside of my heart that values that more than going off and saving the nations. <laughs> They're both true. They're both good. They're both led by the Lord. But your heart, open to the Lord, saying, this is difficult right at home where I'm at. I have to be good here so that I can be good there. So I have something to give when I get there because it's actually established in me on the inside here. Right? This is, this is where life comes, guys. This is, this is abundant life. This is life from our Father to us. Now, last layer. Um, I want to tell you about another experience I had. I was worshiping the Lord right over here. The worship team was leading a song about um, the gates of the Lord. Swing wide the gates. 
I'm just worshiping away, and Holy Spirit says into my heart, gates are hearts. Gates are hearts. Went to, once sat down, Pastor Jamie then took us to this scripture, uh, Psalm 24-7. Same sermon, right? He's, he's preaching. Lift up your heads, O you gates, and be lifted up, you everlasting doors, that the king of glory may come in. So I'm thinking, all right, gates are hearts. Who are heads? This isn't a literal. Gates weren't literal. Heads is, aren't literal. This is, a, this is a type. What are heads? Can you think of heads? Wives, your husband is called the head of the household. <laughs> There's a head. Heads of state. The Lord says, honor kings and all who are in authority. Lift up heads. What about spiritual heads? Are there spiritual heads, pastors or leaders that the Lord has talked to you about to be connected with? Lift them up. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Then be lifted up, you everlasting doors. The everlasting doors, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. This is worship of our King, of our Savior, of our God, right? They're the only ones to worship. They're the only ones to give glory and honor and praise forever and ever too. But if we do the lifting up of the heads in our hearts, or, I love this verse, I actually saw this verse in Bloomington in a street sign within the last month. All they did was say, sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Sanctify. Sanctify means to put and set aside him in the most precious place of your heart. <laughs> we have, there's something to do there, right? Sanctify the Lord. So when you, he's part of headship for sure. But if we set our hearts with our heads lifted up and then we're going to praise the Lord, the promise, the carrot here is that the king of glory will come in. How many of you want the king of glory to come in? This is the carrot. Hey, this is how I'm coming. Lift up your heads, O you gates. Be lifted up, you everlasting doors. Praise the Lord. The king of glory is about to come in. Into your life, into your heart, into your responsibility, into your authority, and you get to have him doing the stuff. Now, the, the challenging part is, in our hearts, we often don't have heads. Well, they're not the boss of me. <laughs> I don't care what God said about lifting up. I, they're not the boss of me. I'm going straight to Jesus all day long, every day. You should. It's a really good starting place. But he connects us by grace with each other. He gives us authority to help and to bless each other. It's not for control, because everybody's afraid of that. It's not that. That's not how leaders lead. It's not how kings exercise their authority. That's not how it's done. But we're afraid because we're concerned that I would put somebody else in my heart before the Father. Don't ever do that, ever. But he says, lift them up. Honor them. Maybe pray for them. It's what the instruction is with kings and all of them in authority. They're not even believers. You're praying for and lifting up unbelievers because of the word of the Lord, because the carrot is that the king of glory is going to come in. And when he comes, he's going to bring the fullness of his grace, light, life, revelation, truth, fullness, and you're going to see, oh, I should be doing this. I should be thinking this way. I should be receiving differently. And all of a sudden, your life becomes empowered to become productive inside of you where the kingdom is being built in your heart, become productive 
in the kingdom of God. Yeah. Yeah. All right. Can you stand to your feet? I'm going to be done. Kind of done. Classic preacher, right? Kind of done. Um, I want to invite us to pray in a certain way this morning. Um, I want us to begin to thank the Lord for everything in that box of grace, that present gift that he's given us. Okay? I want you to begin to say thank you for the gift of love. Thank you for humility. Thank you for grace. You can just start whenever you want. I'm just praying. You start just thanking him. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for meekness. Thank you for kindness. Thank you for um, promises. Thank you that you've given me exceedingly great and precious promises. Thank you for all of them. Thank you for my family, my wife, my children. Thank you for my church. Thank you for my pastors. Thank you, Lord. Thank you. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Now, I want you to try to sanctify the Lord in your hearts. Just do that. Set him in a place. Just, just practice it. Lord, I set you in the preeminent place of my heart. I thank you for being there. I thank you for working from that place and transforming my life. I thank you. I put you there. Just say, Father, forgive me where I have not been able to receive um, the heads that you've given me in my life. I want you to come in, Lord. I want the fullness of your kingdom and your glory, your great work, exceedingly perfect and beautiful work, full of goodness and glory. I want that in my life. But Lord, I, I, I don't know how to lift up heads. Forgive me if I have misplaced or if I've stopped doing that. Forgive me. Come on, you're having a conversation with the Lord. Forgive me, Lord. Speak to me about headship. I thank you for President Biden. I thank you for Governor Waltz. I thank you for the mayor of my city. I thank you for all those who are in authority over the land, whether they know you or not. Because of your word, I say thank you. Thank you for them. Bless them, help them. Protect them, keep them, give them wisdom and understanding. We pray for peace in the land through decisions, godly decisions. Thank you for them. Bless them. It's irrespective of political party. Thank you, Lord. We obey you, King of kings and Lord of lords. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. So, Lord, I just thank you that the King of glory is coming in. <laughs> I thank you for you and your excellent work coming forth and exploding in grace and hearts this morning. Father, that lives are transformed, that we, um, by your grace, through your grace, and into eternal life in the covenant that you've cut, Jesus. We just thank you for it. We bless you in our hearts. Hallelujah. Oh, can you just put your hands out in front of you for a second? Say, Jesus. Come on, say this out loud with me. Say, Jesus, I receive all that you have for me. Wow. Thank you that it's good, that it produces goodness, <laughs> that you partner with me. Thank you to see your kingdom come and your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Thank you, Lord. It's in Jesus' name I pray. And now, Father, just bless these people, Lord. May the Lord bless you. May the Lord keep you. 
May his face shine upon you and be gracious to you. May he lift up your, his countenance upon you and give you his peace. Wow. And you're coming and you're going and you're waking and you're sleeping all your days, all your moments, all your life through eternity. In Jesus' mighty name. And everybody who agreed with that said, amen. Come on, give the Lord a clap.